Well, thank you everyone for signing in to the Fusion Party's New South Wales Candidate Forum. Um, there's, um, there's plenty of uh, candidate forums going on in the real world and online, but uh, we found that there are um, maybe less opportunities than usual this time around, um, possibly partly due to COVID, possibly due to smaller parties being frozen out. So thank you very much for participating in Democracy and uh, joining us online tonight. Uh, signing in from around New South Wales and possibly beyond, but the candidates are from New South Wales. And I'm uh, signing in from Marrickville in Sydney's inner west. And uh, I acknowledge that uh, I'm living and working on Gadigal country of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Gadigal elders past and present. As we near the election, I'd ask us all to keep in mind that the, the climate breakdown that we're facing is a it's a crisis of human health. It's presented as an environmental problem, but it's very much a crisis of human health. Extreme weather disrupts connection to country and it disrupts the ability to access and seek healthcare services. So climate change is going to have its most severe health effects on people who have already uh, have the worst health outcomes. There's, um, there's local and First Nations knowledge that we can and should be consulting and incorporating in our fight for a safe planet. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrea Leong and I'm the president of Fusion and the lead Senate candidate for Fusion in New South Wales. So tonight I'm going to um, introduce our lower house candidates and we'll all um, talk about what our campaigns are about and then we will welcome questions from you all. Um, and here tonight, we have our five lower house candidates from New South Wales, Brendan Clark from Barara in Sydney's north, Jeff Barnes from Dobell on the central coast, James Haggerty from Graindler in the inner west, John August from Benelong on Sydney's north shore, and Saha Kalili from Reed in Sydney's outer inner west. And my running mate in the Senate is Ian Bryce, who couldn't join us tonight. Um, so let's uh, begin the um, introductions and uh, let's start with, uh, let's go alphabetically. Uh, so Brendan, um, please introduce yourself and let us know your priorities for the 2022 election campaign. Yeah, uh, g'day everyone. Um, uh, my name's uh, Brendan Clark and I'm the candidate for the for Braille for the Fusion Party. Yeah. I suppose a little bit about me. Uh, I uh, grew up in a small town of Aberdeen up in the Upper Hunter Valley. Um, I'm currently working as a computer systems engineer at the Commonwealth Bank, and I've been living in Hornsby Heights since 2007. Um, I moved there basically to get a good educational outcome for my two daughters, and uh, we moved to the area for the good schools and the wonderful community. Uh, my daughters went to the primary school at Hornsby North uh, Public School, uh, and then my daughter went to Hornsby Girls, and my other daughter is currently studying HSC at the North Sydney Girls. Um, I got into politics basically because I was inspired by Paul Keating's vision of creating a high tech uh, future, uh, basically transitioning from primary industries into knowledge and technology based economy. Um, I wrote that as a uh, when I was basically in around about second or third class at uh, primary school. Um, that resonated with me for a long time. Well, and why we digging up coal and exporting gas and things like that. And I thought we should be we should be transitioning to our own version of Silicon Valley, such so as we've got in the United States and elsewhere. Um, I joined the Science Party uh, back in, uh, I think it was about 2014, um, then it was called the Future Party. And we had dreams of bringing that science and technology uh, basis back to the forefront of Australian government policy. I ran as a candidate in 2016 and 2019 federal elections and also as a New South Wales Legislative Council. Um, I believe that science is all about the continuous improvement and I believe that we can take that same approach to uh, with politics. We can apply that same sort of rigour. Um, I was drawn to the Science Party by its principles um, and its focus on developing policy through the scientific method. And I believe that through these principles and innovative policies, we can create those, we can test them, and we can improve them as we get new evidence or new facts and we learn new information along the way. Uh, last year, 
the Liberals introduced the legislation into uh, Parliament in an attempt to kill minor parties because they were very scared of them. Um, and that attack on our democracy, we fought back by actually merging with other like-minded parties. Um, so that's how we became the Fusion Party. Uh, my background is I'm, I'm a transhumanist uh, and a technology evangelist. So what that means is I am got the belief that we can solve the world's problems with the application of science and technology to solve all the world's problems. And um, we can solve climate change, poverty, inequality, global conflicts, and improve the quality of life for all. Uh, only if we uh, put that same level of uh, focus into those science and technology and evidence-based policies. Uh, I suppose one of the other things that inspired me towards joining politics was when uh, Tony Abbott took power back, back in 2013 with his first actual policy was to abolish the position of science minister. Uh, and also he cut, you know, the budget the CSIRO. That inspired me to actually take action and join politics. Um, I'm not currently content with Australia just having a small place in the world. I see Australia as a potential world leader in science, education, innovation and healthcare. We've got the raw materials, we've got the uh, people, we've got the technology, uh, we just haven't got the political will. And that's why we need to get rid of this current government and we need to actually uh, get some more progressive uh, people into parliament. Uh, Australian should be the country that the world looks to as a beacon of success. Uh, for a, we'd want you to get to free culture, uh, more open democracy, real action on climate change. Uh, and I believe that we can actually be uh, the world leader in most of these things. Uh, I'm hoping that everyone else also shares those same dreams with us. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan. All right, well, let's move on to uh, Jeff Barnes in Dobell. Uh, Jeff, what are your main issues? And tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, my name is Jeff Barnes. I'm the Fusion Party member for Dobell. My chosen platforms are ethical governance, a fair and inclusive society, individual freedoms. My background is in working as a professional composer and sound designer. Uh, Composing is a collaborative art. We work with ensembles of like minded professionals and the understanding that. Each member brings with them a unique set of highly specialised skills. In any group of individuals with a common set of goals or obvious parallels, I believe ethical governance is about harnessing known facts to deliver compassionate outcomes that hopefully enriches us as a society. We need to be about levelling the playing field as best as we're able. Nobody begrudges the money governments spend on public goods and services if they pass a cost benefits analysis and enhance our national quality of life, we're duty bound to call out corruption and flagrant dishonesty. Blatant pork barreling is a waste of the tax dollar. I think we can do better. The current system of government is compromised beyond repair. They're basically counting on the pump difference. I mean, this week alone, we've seen a sharp rise in the cost of living, inflation and interest rates against historically low wages. Add to that the incompetence of mass homelessness in flood zones, aged care catastrophes, long-term absenteeism with bushfires, pandemics, droughts and foreign affairs. All of this encased in the denialism of ICAC, the car parks, the sporting grants, the legal fees, the out-of-court settlements, the ministerial appointments and the moral degradation within our national parliament building itself. I believe that every individual needs to be responsible for their actions and the buck should stop with us. The Fusion Party is singularly blessed with a wealth of knowledge and experience that expands way beyond my meagre understanding of how the world works. Curiosity and conviction are powerful tools. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and now let's hear from James Haggerty for Grantler. who appears to be on mute.
Mm -hmm. I need to move forward as he looks, looks at it. Yep. All right. Sorry about that, uh, John. We're going to skip to you on short notice. If you can reach for that unmute button. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, my name's John August. I'm the uh, I'm in the pirate branch of fusion. I'm the candidate for Benelong. Now, Benelong includes the Wallamatta area or region of Aboriginal land. And uh, yeah, so I'm based in Ride and I've been here for a very long time, which is why I guess I'm standing in Benelong. It seems to make a bit of sense, even if you might label it as sort of a, a strong Liberal Party seat. I still think there's you know, a lot of people thinking here and there's, there's lots of opportunity. So uh, in my case, you know, I was drawn to politics by a sense of just how many people were doing and saying stupid things that didn't make sense. And, you know, for some of us, there's different things that draw us to policy, politics. For me, it was just a frustration for the stupid things that people around me seemed to be saying and getting away with and nobody in the media was, was challenging them. Um, you know, within my own personal history, secular issues and a pushback against the influence of religion on politics was something that I was uh, uh, strong about. But there's also intellectual property and its abuse. And, you know, you have copyright, you have patents, which are basically much abused. And uh, the Pirate Party was a group that's sort of very concerned about that. But there's also the story of uh, foreign policy hypocrisy. And obviously, there's the way we're dealing with Julian Assange, but we also have Witness K whistleblowers like that. Um, going back in history, we have the Indonesian mass killings and the Balabo Five, um, which I think we do need to acknowledge. More recently, there's issues around West Papua. So there's a lot of things locally that we want to worry about. But there's also China, and people have been criticising China. Uh, in times past, I actually gave a speech in support of Hong Kong students at Sydney University. But the thing that I was emphasising was just because I'm criticising China doesn't mean that I'm pro-US. They're both equally bad in their own way. And, you know, we do want to uh, forge our, our own path forward. But there is economics and obviously housing affordability is a bit of an issue. And I mean, there's lots of things we can bring to bear. But one of the things that certainly uh, Fusion is concerned about is the hollowing out of different numbers. Like CPI doesn't actually include the cost of uh, land and property as part of achieving housing. And then we have unemployment, which doesn't include uh, the fact that some unemployment is getting precarious, that it's getting part time. And, you know, there can be so many changes underneath those numbers. And yet governments run around saying, oh, look, we've employed, improved unemployment by 0.2%. Aren't we wonderful? And I'm thinking, well, no, um, but uh, that's sort of uh, some of the things that I am concerned about. And it's obviously what sort of drives me uh, within fusion. So anyway, that's, that's where I'm coming from. And those are my concerns. And there's obviously many aspects to policy, economics, you know, global warming and so on that I could be speaking about. But, you know, there, there's, in a sense, there's so many problems in the world, more than you can poke a stick at. At any given time, you can only talk about so much. But I think I'll leave it at that and pass on to someone else. Thanks very much, John. And I've heard it said, and I agree, that uh, political accountability might not be the, the only problem we face, but it's the one we have to face before we can face any others. Um, all right, let's continue on with Saha Khalili, our candidate for Reid. Good evening. Um, so... My name is Saha. Um, I've lived in this area for about five years now, just in Tremoyen. Have been loving the Bay Run, um, especially over the pandemic. It was my main activity. Um, I've only recently come into politics and the thing that really pushed me into it was um, just seeing the inaction that was happening with um, Scott Morrison um, with the bushfires. I think that was the first time where we really saw the huge impact of just a natural disaster affecting us in the city, even though houses were burning down uh, south of the coast. Um, and, and just seeing his reluctance and not really seeing the urgency of him coming back from Hawaii just pissed me off. And um, what I do for work is uh, I moved from being a pharmacist to moving into um, being a business analyst in IT projects, especially in health. 
So I was um, implementing health software and medical software and electronic records and all of that. So just very complex, large scale projects. We spend a lot of time uh, convincing people how to um, embrace the change and understand the change and how it's better for you. And, um, and I feel government has missed out on this, uh, just this push to improve themselves and to be more efficient and to be more just do things better. Um, and so when I saw that happening, I, I just had to get involved. I Googled federal ICAC and I came across the science party and had a look. It was the first time because I was actively disengaged. I thought, you know, I feel politics is hard to get into. It's hard to understand. People intellectualize it way too much and it, it becomes like a, you know, uh, you have to know what you're talking about to have an opinion sort of approach. Um, well, we can all have opinions and I think what we really need to do is make um, the whole political process more accessible to people, transparent uh, and accommodating to people. And all of those things have really just contributed to the corrupt, well, the alleged corruption that we're seeing. Um, which has also contributed to the reluctance to uh, address the climate change that's happening. Um, so I'm really glad that I jumped in and I've spent, you know, at least every week with the science party, talking to them, learning more about politics and realizing that being part of a smaller party means that you're with a group of people who really care about how they want the world to be. And, um, and yeah, so that's where I'm going and I'll be standing for a serious response for climate change, transparency and accountability in politics. Thank you, Saha. And um, we're all glad you found your political home in the Science Party and now with Fusion. And now since uh, James I has- I think I'm back, right? Ooh. Can Hello? you hear me now, Andrew? Oh, yes. Hello. So. All right. Um, are you uh, right to- speak now james yeah sure i had Great. some technical issues um we're no, now just in the, time perfect the wrong microphone but anyway um yeah so i'm james haggerty i'm standing in Graemler. um my background is mostly in in education and computing um i have a couple of kids lived in the inner west my whole life although i admit that some i actually grew up in the outer inner west in reed um in croydon actually um i'm now living in Enmore. Um, I was actually one of the founding members of the Science Party, which was then the Future Party back in 2013. I'd say the main reason I'm standing is that, you know, I actually, as much as I sort of agree with everyone saying, oh, no, this is broken, this is frustrating, I'm kind of optimistic. I think we actually do come up with all these ideas that will help address problems. And, you know, you see it in academia, you see it in royal commissions, you see it in reviews, and there's this sort of, oh, okay, here we have this big problem, but here's this sort of list of 10 or 15 recommendations. And then, you know, two or three years down the track, the government sort of puts it aside or says, oh, yeah, we did two of those and the other eight seemed a bit hard. Um, so we have the ideas, we, we just pour on the follow through. Um, the government gets too focused on the short term, the, the current budget, the election, you know, whatever the current priorities are, and they they give up on trying to explain nuanced policy and, you know, trying to say, oh, look, you know, this might cause a bit of short term pain, but in long term, this will happen, etc. It's all about the, the immediate message. Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe we're right, like with the current level of engagement that that's not actually a vote winner um, when you're trying when you're working within the two-party system and fighting for marginal electorates. Um, but I think there is a place for people who are interested in doing the right thing, sort of regardless of that political blowback, I guess. Um, and I think that you know the Science Party and the Fusion Party, we are sort of prepared to annoy some people a little bit rather than play it safe all the time to say, hey, we think this is a really good policy, even though it's going to cause some some short-term pain. Um, because in the long term, this is where we want to be. Um, so I, I see this all across our policy platform, actually, you know, this, this sort of, we've, everyone who's looked into it knows that this thing is a good idea, but it's a bit of, it, it's a hard sell sometimes. So, you know, changing stamp duty into land tax, carbon price has obviously been a, you know, hard sell in Australian politics for a long time, ending fossil fuel subsidies, abolishing the, the CGT discount for property, 
having a constitutional bill of rights, dramatically increasing R&D support, pain and copyright reform. There are all these things that, you know, the people who are experts in the area or have thought a lot about it think, well, yeah, sure, why wouldn't you do this? But it's hard to get political traction for them. Um, so there's that side of like, I just want good policy happening um, and I think this is the Fusion Party is a way to promote that and to make it happen. Um, then there's, of course, there's other things that are hard sells, the ones that are against politicians' own interests, like, you know, transparent government and federal ICAC and all those sort of things. And I think it's very depressing how the Morrison government has sort of increased the level of secrecy in government and in sort of the name of media messaging over the past, over, over its past term, just to try and they're focused on controlling the message. They're not focused on actually telling people about what's going on. Um, so yeah, I see Fusion as the party prepared to do some things that are unpopular for some, but good for Australia in, in the long term. Um, and if I can play even a small part about letting people know about, well, hey, these policies are actually good policies, I'm thrilled to do so. Thank you very much, James. Um, all right, we've heard from our lower house candidates. Now I'll just briefly uh, introduce myself. Um, so I grew up in Warrnambool in regional Victoria, which is a, a blue ribbon liberal seat. Uh, Jeff Kennett's state government closed down my primary school when I was nine years old. So I've always been aware of political issues and that there, there, there were people making decisions that affected our lives and they were separate from the rest of us. Um, I avoided party politics all through um, through uni, um, but uh, stayed connected to those issues, going to rallies for oh, same-sex marriage was taking off at the time. Um, and oh, what were the other, the other issues that got me out into the street? Um, well, in any case, uh, I later moved up to Sydney in 2011. And I, um, I still wasn't involved in party politics then, but I saw the future party on my uh, local ballot for Kingsford Smith. And I thought, oh, I'll check them out. That, uh, you know, I've got, I've got dozens, of, dozens of parties to check out on the Senate ballot. Where am I gonna start? So I saw the future party on my lower house ballot which is why I think it's so important to have lower house candidates. It really, it um, makes you stand out. Makes, it's like, super throwing your hat in the ring if you're running in lower house seats as well as the Senate, I find. Looked up the future party, found that they uh, aligned really well with what I was, what I cared about politically and uh, got involved from there as it became the science party in 2016 and uh, now is obviously part of the fusion party. So just to explain why we became the fusion party, late last year, around September, a bill was rushed through parliament in the space of a few weeks to increase the minimum membership numbers of small parties. So you used to need 500 members to maintain a registered political party. And then that was changed very quickly to become 1500 members. So that put a lot of the small parties in a spin. And um, the, the parties that came together to form Fusion, we all considered you know, we could do a massive membership drive and um, grow really quickly, but we thought that would be unsustainable. We all had a chat and found that we were all really working towards the same ideals. So it was actually um, a really um, a really easy decision to come together, uh, fuse into a bigger party that has uh, specialised policy knowledge in a lot of areas and. Uh, covers a lot more of the country. So you might've noticed that um, many of our candidates here tonight have spoken about being part of the future or the science party, um, but we're also really, um, uh, it's fantastic that we've got um, the Pirate Party, which has uh, got a lot of members in Queensland and uh, Climate Emergency Action Alliance, which has a lot of members in Victoria uh, and the Secular Party as well in Victoria. So, um, increasing our geographical reach and our policy depth and breadth um, has let us come to this election stronger than we would have separately. Now I've, um, as I said, coming from the, the science party and the, the, the future party, I got into politics because I was really, really excited about the possibilities of the future um, in Australia does such fantastic 
research in biomedical research and materials research and nuclear physics and and so many areas agricultural research and I saw that we weren't um, we weren't funding these discoveries to the extent that we could be so uh, we've got a long-standing policy that's uh, come through into the fusion platform of doubling research funding we've got experts who we delegate the decision to to uh, to allocate research funding um, on the basis of grant applications. And they consistently say that about half of the applications they get are worthwhile. They're good research projects that should be funded. But the number that actually gets funded is 15 or 20% and it's dropping. Australia could be leading the world in so many areas of research, bringing these new discoveries to the world, but we just don't. Uh, it's there's an initial outlay financially, but this comes back to the economy and to society in the form of longer and happier and healthier lives. So that's one thing that I really uh, care a lot about that government can affect. But as a lot of us this election have found, we've we've had to. Um, give a lot of our focus to integrity in government, campaigning on getting a federal anti-corruption commission and pushing for climate emergency action to admit, admit that we have a huge and urgent problem and need to reduce our carbon emissions and then um, take us into negative emissions to um, bring us down to safe levels of greenhouse gases. So I'm, I'm still excited. <laughs> about those prospects for the future but there's just these these pressing issues that really should not be partisan um, our parliament should be working together towards um, a safe climate and integrity in government but we're not seeing that and so since we don't see that option in parliament uh, that is um, why i've put my hand up and uh, am running for the senate all right well um there's our introductions and we've got a few uh, um, questions in the chat. So we'll go to those. And uh, we've got a hand up from Simon, but I think I'll go through a couple of the ones in the chat and I'll get back to you, Simon. Uh, so the first question we have is from Kate, which is, why should I vote for the Fusion Party rather than the Greens? Would anyone like to take this in particular or Kate, did you want to direct that to anyone in particular? No, just whoever's prepared to answer it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I can give an answer. Um, it's funny, this is a question we get asked quite a lot. And I think uh, it's only natural because we are aligned with um, some of the priorities of the Greens. Definitely both agree with prioritising the climate and both of us agree with uh, integrity as in not accepting donations from organisations and companies. Uh, compared to the major parties Liberal and Labor do, and it's really influencing their policies. Um, I can go into that in detail, but that's a bit of a side thing. Um, so we are aligned in that way, but I think the question always feels unfair to me because it, uh, it kind of isn't allowing diversity in parties that share the same values. In, at least in Reed, um, we have many conservative, uh, right libertarian type of parties. We've got uh, One Nation, which I'm a bit doubtful. I think recently they were just saying a lot of their, their candidates that they've put up are not actually running. I don't know what's going on there. We've got UAP, we've got the Lib Dems, we've got Liberal, uh, we've got Labor that's, you know, changed its ways. Um, so there isn't too much variety there but then as soon as someone is similar to greens it's just why are you here we need more diversity for people who are leaning in that more progressive uh angle um and then the other thing is as well um the greens they are not open at all to nuclear um whereas we want to at least uh approach researching um, and understanding more about how we can use fusion energy, which will be clean, efficient, if we uh, really want to invest in um, renewable energy futures. So that's my take on that. 
Yeah, thanks, Saha. That's a really important point about fusion energy. There's the joke. Uh, so fusion, as opposed to all of the all of the nuclear power plants that we have in the world at the moment, are fission plants, and fusion is the type of energy that's in development at the moment and isn't being used to supply any energy. And the joke is that it's always 30 years away. It's only 30 years away because we uh, don't fund it enough. We've found with every, every time we have a technology that is uh, you know, burgeoning, um, if, if people have the means to do that research, then the, the answer does uh, it, it gets discovered when we when we've got people um, on the job? Uh, it's we know it's an engineering problem uh, right now. So uh, sorry, fusion fusion power is going to be a source of clean. Um, there's no waste um, to speak of. There's it's uh, clean abundant energy that is going to be so much that we don't know what uh, what we'll be able to do with it. John. Okay, yes, I, I suppose I do think that between fusion and Pirate Party in particular, we have much richer policies when it comes to intellectual property, government surveillance, and foreign policy. And I do think the Greens are just willing to just take a back seat and let copyright develop as it may. And then when it comes to economics, like certainly in the Pirate Party and fusion has adopted it, we've had a universal basic income policy for ages and it's something the greens have only recently come on board with so i would say that our policy is richer and more detailed particularly when it comes to uh, economics um, government surveillance consideration about whistleblowers ethics and so on which is not to say the greens don't act on these issues but i do think that our base of operations is richer draws on a lot more intellectual strength and that we actually have stronger positions than the Greens in a lot of areas now. You talk about nuclear, certainly intellectual property, you can define differences. And I do believe the Greens have actually gone on with, gone along with some of the government increases to surveillance and sort of changes to the way things are done. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, so. Thanks, John. Um, the Science Party also had a policy of 800% uh, renewables, which has been incorporated into Fusion's platform. And, um, you know, we were laughed at for that 800% renewables policy. And then the Greens brought a 700% renewables policy to the table. So if you want a good policy just a little bit sooner, uh, come to Fusion. James? Yeah, sorry, I think we probably should move on from this question, but I really wanted to just add one thing. I think the thing, the way part of how I see Fusion and, and where I'm coming from is that I feel like in not without getting into specific policy detail compared to the Greens, I feel like we are more optimistic about the future and we're more a slightly more economically centrist like as in in a sense that greens ultimately have there's a large proportion of greens members who are from what i would describe as fairly hardcore left wing and in the fusion party i think we're more open to argument about these things and sort of saying well what's the best way forward what's the academic what's the consensus among economists about how to do this thing rather than just being like oh no yes we should have rent control to control housing prices or, or things like that Anyway, hmm. um, you make a good point that um, we've got uh, the questions are coming in steadily now. So we'll um, make our responses quick and snappy. Um, thank you, Kate, for the first question. Uh, I think the, the advantage of asking the first question is you got a, a broad range of responses. The second question is to Jeff in particular. And the question is, I'd like to know what Jeff's key issues are for Dobell specifically uh, that he'd see as priorities for change. Wow, no. Well, Dobell is, we have a lot of unemployed people here, a lot of underemployed people. It's a gig economy, particularly for young people. Um, you know, bam and coffee's out for a few hours a week. It's not going to uh, keep a roof over your head. Um, we have severe problems with the uh, real estate values going through the ceiling, which push, is pushing um, low income people out of, out of rentals. Um, that's under stress. Uh, <laughs> half of, half of um, where I live was underwater a couple of weeks ago. Um, flood mitigation would be something. The price of petrol, we're a consuming, we, we are, um, you know, well, 
I used to drive to Sydney every day. The price of fuel would be, would be doing my head in about now. So we need to do something about, about that. Electric vehicles. We had a look the other day at um, charging stations for electric vehicles. Of the two that exist in Long Jetty, we found one in a car park with a, a bloke had parked his, his old, um, I don't know, Commodore on the green space. Um, Dobell, Dobell's got a, a, a lot of problems. The, going back to the lake, there's been a 300% increase in pollution in the last 12 months on that lake. Um, so, you know, the, we have dredging issues. We have, um, our beaches are being eroded. We've got houses in Wombrel falling into the sea. Um, I would say the climate emergency is, is alive and well, and we're, we're seeing it firsthand here. Um, hmm. Do you see any immediate opportunities for um, employment in the region? Well, we have a lot of industrial areas tucked away there that uh, we, could, we could be a manufacturing hub. We're ideally placed, we're halfway between Newcastle and Sydney. So there's opportunity there. I, I think for uh, you know, going forward, we have a big take up here of solar. I'm, I'm seeing more and more um, Teslas and Konas and things on the road. So um, the, yeah, there's heaps, of, there's heaps of opportunities. We've just got to basically um, you know, refund the CSIRO for instance, that would be good. Um, yeah. Just, you know, Mm, and the rollout of clean energy, that's that's an employment opportunity that's, you know, it's not to be missed. That's that's a lot of yeah. jobs in trades, honestly, that um, we should be taking advantage of sooner rather than later. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, oof, here's a hairy question. Uh, if the Libs win this election, what are your predictions for the short-term future in Australia? I suppose for me that would be summed up by stagnation, um, and more of the same, but with perhaps more disengagement in politics. Does anyone else have any anything they'd like to add? Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I think if we had another three years of the Liberal government, I think that would be the complete and utter destruction of Australia. I, I think, and I'm not, not trying to blow that out of proportion, I see we'd be going down the route of what's happening in the United States at the moment. You've seen what's happened with the Republican government where they're actually getting a lot of uh, religious-based stuff in politics. Uh, you've seen the, the potential ban on abortions um, in, in politics. You've seen the attack on trans kids um, in sport. Um, and the lady that actually brought that up, they haven't proved that it was all, you know, basically politically motivated and there was no basis, in fact. So um, one of the big worries is Medicare. Uh, there's already been... Lots of money ripped out of Medicare at the moment, so there's been destruction of Medicare by stealth. There's been half a billion dollars ripped out of public education, and I'm afraid that that's going to even be more. Um, there's going to be absolutely zero action on climate change. There's going to be more mines opening up. Uh, we don't need coal. We, we've got enough coal in existing coal mining operations in Australia to do us forever. We do not need any new coal mines. Um, Fusion doesn't necessarily advocate closing down coal mines right now. Uh, there's got to be a transition to renewable energy, but there should never be any new coal mines. Thermal coal mines should not be opened up in Australia. Um, and I suppose the last one I was wanting to talk about was um, uh, the Indu card, so the cashless welfare card. So we're going to be seeing a lot more people placed on that um, and potentially pensions as well. Um, that's basically a private institution that the government gave the authority to charge $10,000 per user on that card. And uh, that means they've taken all the autonomy out of the hands of anyone who's on that card. Mm. You cannot spend money in your rent. Um, where basically it's leaving people homeless because there's been so many issues with the card uh, being reliable, uh, that landlords will not rent places to people who are on the card. And it's just gonna be much, much more of this uh, going forward. Yep. Thank you, Brendan. And uh, James, we'll hear from you quickly before we go to a, uh, a voice yeah, question. Sure. 
I mean, I think I think I'm more optimistic about Brendan in terms of I don't think you know this is the end of Australia as we know it. But what I do think a second a, a victory for Morrison would would lead to is kind of Labor's kind of learned the lesson that they can't propose policy right from the from the last election. We we just can't take any risks because apparently Morrison could go to an election with purely marketing and spending a lot of money on marginal seats. If we let that happen again, then I think that lesson is going to become very entrenched in Australian politics. That you know don't propose policy, give out money as in whatever way it seems it will buy votes and control the message hide what's happening in government, all of these things. Um, if we reward the Morrison government for that, then it's going to become more of a problem. Um, so and finally, very quickly, John. Okay, I'd say most of what people are saying is valid, but it does depend. If Liberals still romp it in, I think all these predictions are true. If the Libs either win narrowly or have to basically negotiate with the crossbenchers, I think they will be more circumspect and willing to change. And, you know, there are people in the Liberal Party who do push for progressive things and, you know, uh, you know um, action on climate change. And I think they've been marginalised. But if the Liberal Party only marginally wins, I think they will be circumspect and look at themselves. So it, it depends is my uh, more complicated answer. Mm, thanks, John. It seems my prediction of stagnation was uh, optimistic. Um, how about we take a uh, question from the floor now with uh, Simon? Hi everyone, it's really good to hear from you. Um, I've been following Science Party probably since 2015, 2016. One of the things I found difficult to find out during that period um, is who we're preferencing. And so I'd like to know you come in this election, who we're preferencing and why we've chosen those um, or that party. Mm, thanks, yes. Um, um, so we can only do that once we get, it has happened already, we've found out who who is running and um, I've just put up the uh, the preferences for the New South Wales Senate um, that Fusion is recommending on my uh, my web page today and I'll be pushing that out. So we um, we make our preferences uh, preference recommendations based on uh, how similar um, our values are to the other candidates. And it's very important, I think, to point out now that uh, we don't have the system we used to have up until 2016, um, where that group voting ticket system. So that was the one where you put the one above the line and the party would allocate all your preferences for you. Um, so I just want to make clear for everyone in the room that that doesn't happen anymore. Um, and the new voting system since 2016 is that you number in the Senate uh, at least six candidates above the line or at least sorry at least six groups above the line or at least 12 candidates below the line six above or 12 below um, but you should number as many boxes as you can until you can't pick any difference between the remaining candidates um, so despite the, the suggestions that we're giving that's uh, the kind of the bare minimum that we think um, that we would suggest um, but if uh, if you've looked at the other candidates and seen that you've got more preferences that you can pick beyond the ones that we've suggested, then um, we'd absolutely encourage you to, to go for that. Um, and our lower house candidates are uh, publishing their recommendations for, um, for all the other candidates in their seats as well, because we definitely have uh, strong thoughts on who we want to see win if we do not. Um, how's that? Um, yeah, I suppose you you mentioned that it, it's hard to find. So I suppose um, if we have it on our websites, we should be pushing it out through our social media channels as well. Um, let me know if you've got any, any other suggestions there, Simon. All right, thank you. You could probably just list them now, right, Andrew? You've memorised your the seven. You know. Oh right? no! <laughs> I wouldn't oh. want to make a mistake there. <laughs> Uh, Brendan, if it's okay. Yeah, I was, I guess that's real quick. Uh, so for Lower House, um, uh, the way I've always uh, done preferences, and I think this is probably for the other candidates, is that we uh, we usually speak to people who uh, are the local candidates in the actual area, and we actually talk to them, and we actually get an agreement of where they're going to preference us, and we preference them, uh, based on who we talk to and how their policies align with us. Uh, and so... Uh, that happens basically at the ballot box. I talk to the candidates and then we basically uh, get an agreement that way. 
Mm, um, and I think that's better because we don't know who the candidates are and how they're going to preference. And I suppose uh, what I've done is I've always done a circular preference of Labor and the Greens because um, I'm in a very, very safe Liberal seat and Labor and the Greens tend to be the most progressive parties in my area. Um, but uh, this year we've got an extra independent who's actually uh, there, which I haven't had a chance to speak to at the moment, but uh, I'll be finalising my preferences soon after I speak to him as well. Mm. So that can explain, yeah, why sometimes there'll be um, there'll be some slight differences in different seats. So we'll tend to put small parties and independents that align well with us in the second place, and then sooner and oh, you know, soon enough we'll be suggesting Greens and Labor, and the order of those might change depending on the the seat and the the particular candidate and how well we think those candidates uh, are pushing the the ideals that we that we agree with. Uh, we've got a comment here from David in the chat. Uh, pleased to hear a strong, consistent message that fusion candidates support a progressive but moderate, rational, evidence-based and compassionate approach to government, policy and solving world problems. Um, and um, you can see in the chat, uh, David has uh, put a link to a website if you're interested. Thank you for the encouragement and the kind words, David. A question now from Susan. Can you explain the thinking behind classifying aging as a disease? Now, this is a question that we get quite a lot and I know Brendan is probably best placed to answer this one. Um, the, the outcome that we want from this is for people to live uh, longer and healthier lives. So not just, uh, you know, not just living longer and in the, um, uh, the condition that we've, we've come to associate with aging, but to live healthier lives for longer. So what's known as the, the health span, um, as well as our lifespan, extending, extending our health span. But uh, Brendan might have something to add there. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so basically, the treating aging disease is very, very important because one of the few things that happens when you get older is that you often get uh, debilitating illnesses. Um, yeah, you may get... Uh, start off, you know, you get sore knees or something, right? You go to the doctor and go, oh, my knees are sore, and they go, you're just getting old. Uh, for me, that's always been a terrible answer because uh, how do they know that my sore knees are caused by age or not if I've done an injury? It's, they, they just wipe it off that you're old and therefore you should expect it. Uh, I've never been a good answer to me because I want to know the root cause of these things. I work in computers, I like to know the root cause. Um, and uh, some very, very smart scientists have actually gone out and actually classified all the cures, oh, sorry, not the cures, all the causes of ageing uh, in, in a human body. Uh, some of those can be reversed, some of those cannot. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why we're going to treat ageing as disease is because uh, ageing is similar to a disease, as in you get certain symptoms and things as you get older. Um, by treating ageing a disease, you can now free up the medical professions to actually treat those causes of ageing. Um, at the moment, there's certain legislation that's in, in certain governments, um, like the United States and Australia, where certain drugs cannot be used because if you're old and you have a, a condition caused by ageing, you're not treated as being sick and therefore you cannot be treated or prescribed the medication to cure that because that drug is meant for something else, even though it may cure your issue, you are not sick, therefore that drug can't be used. Uh, so we want to overturn that and, and basically say, look, ageing is disease. If you've got something that can fix that, uh, we should be able to use that. Um, the holy grail is to basically remove uh, the, the debilitating illnesses of dementia and other things of being in uh, palliative care and uh, you know those nursing homes for a very very long period of time, and make sure that you're healthy um, as long as possible until you're ready to pass away. Okay, um, if we can do that, we can free up hospital systems. Uh, we can save a lot of money on uh, healthcare and actually make better quality of lives than basically trying to prolong people's suffering. Um, and uh, that's basically where it came from, um, and uh, I hope that helps. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Brendan. And uh, Saha, something to add? Yep, just something quickly. Uh, just wanted to add that um, coming from the health professions, um, we're aware of 
just certain definitions when it comes to health or describing health. And we're aware that classifying aging as a disease, uh, you know, isn't the most pleasant wording. And so, you know, we have to be mindful and careful of why we are saying this. And the reason why is for things like um, the definition of health. How do you define good health when it is possible to have a disease like asthma is a disease, but still be healthy? So it's just, it's not saying that um, because you're aging, you're, you know, diseased in a bad way. It's just allowing, um, having that classification for the purposes of uh, drug research and development. So then they can create a drug or a medicine and say, this is for the indication of disease, or, sorry, indication of aging. And then they would be uh, applicable for funding and applicable to prescribe it for people. So then when you have sore knees, people don't just write you off and go, oh, don't worry about it, just write it out. You know, they can say, oh, you might be applicable for this drug or this remedy. And uh, we won't have to just tolerate the, the things that happen, um, well, just the, I guess, the discomforts that we get from aging, yeah. Yeah, now this is very off topic and I'm uh, using my privilege here as the moderator to bring it in. I see a parallel there with um, what we see in uh, reproductive health where um, we're really, we're seeing a, an awareness now uh, with conditions like endometriosis, whereas in the past, uh, so many people were told, oh, it's just, that's just natural. You've just got uh, really bad periods. So you'll just have to deal with it. That's just part of it. Um, so I think there's, there's, I just see a parallel there in uh, seeing that we, we can, uh, we can treat conditions that are uh, disturbing our quality of life and not just accept them because they've always been like that. Thank you, Susan, for the question. Uh, I have a qu uh, another question from Owen here in the, comments. I really love the issues you focus on and the policy platform. However, I do have a large degree of frustration with the system that we currently operate in and the lack of progress on critical issues, regardless of which major party is in power. What's your opinion or thoughts on direct democracy style systems, which focus on individual issues rather than parties or individuals? I guess, uh, not too different perhaps from what they have in Switzerland where there's referendums all the time on all sorts of issues. Does anyone uh, want to jump in on this issue about direct democracy? Uh, yeah, mean, if, no, if no one else is, I have some thoughts. I think the first thought I would have is that as, you know, as a party, we generally, you, you have to be a little bit careful in choosing your issues, right? Um, so, I agree there are lots of problems with our current political system, but I also think that proposing to address them might detract from other messages that we, we are trying to send out. And it's particularly difficult because it sort of can end up looking self-interested where you say, well, you know, the system's broken and therefore we should have, have a greater role in it. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts about that that I probably won't share. Um, the, the other thing I would say with, with direct democracy is that, um, it can be good and can be bad. Like, you know, Andrea mentioned referendum in Switzerland, but similar issues happen in California um, where there are, there are referendums that have uncomfortably restricted what kind of things can happen in, in California and caused a lot of problems for successful governance because, you know, someone can put up something which sounds good and everyone votes for it, but it actually doesn't work well with the rest of the, rest of the legislation. Um, what I find more compelling than a direct democracy model is um, using sortition, um, which is basically saying, hey, you know how we select jurors? Maybe we should, you know, have panels of people that are randomly selected from society as representatives so that they actually have time to think deeply about particular issues um, rather than sort of, you know, having this kind of theatre where we choose people, we should just sample use the power of statistics to get 100 people and say hey think about think about what we should do in this particular area come up with suggestions and then ideally have the government actually listen to those suggestions this has been quite successful in a, in a few cases where similar similar things have been run 
Um, hmm. So I guess that works on a sort of jury duty kind of way and you, you get a letter and uh, you're on the sortition panel this month. Yeah, and look, I mean, you can you can imagine different systems and different ways of payment, but I think in terms of actually getting people from different backgrounds involved and getting those thoughts, rather than kind of trying to get them engaged and vote on something that they ultimately just don't have very much time for, what we kind of want to do is, what I sort of think we want to do is make people from a more diverse range of backgrounds politicians for, for short amounts of time. Um, hmm. Actually, I think the the technical and artistic backgrounds that we've just got on the panel tonight is probably more diverse in terms of career paths than large chunks of the Australian Parliament. John, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess I'm going to push back slightly on that one. Now, the thing is, I guess I'm not really going to talk about the progress of XYZ, but for me, things like federal ICAC um, and basically people calling out uh, false claims for being the nonsense they are. You know, ideas like saying after people retire from Parliament, they can't work in the industry that they were supervising for 10 years. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to improve, I guess, the, the quality of government without going down this particular path. So I, I guess I can see a range of problems and I can see a range of solutions for them. And, you know, I guess, sorry to be a bit negative about this particular one, but I can see other areas to focus on first. Mm. And this is a, an area that um, isn't uh, a part of um, our standing policy platform. So there's a diversity of thought as well on this issue. Um, question from Kim Son. My question is to Saha. Reed is a very diverse seat. What do you think is the way to message and reach people from Lidcombe to Dremoyne? Very good question. It is a huge electorate and very diverse. Um, I think one of my priorities is really making politics uh, accessible and making sure people feel informed. And I think um, a lot of groups are left out of the conversation. I mean, even just um, growing up in Australia, uh, I don't think we have enough extensive um, effort put in to inform people how voting and democracy works here. So just to start, um, I'm speaking to friends who can speak the languages of the different groups within Read. So I've translated my leaflet to be available in Korean and Chinese and Farsi. So my parents, my family uh, is Iranian background. I am trying to find someone who can translate Arabic and um, Italian for me. So if anyone can do that, please. It's surprisingly hard to find people to do that. Um, so that's one way, just translating information into their language. And then also just physically being there. So just going to the busy parts of all the different parts of the electorate and being visible and answering their questions. And um, it's been very enjoyable doing that, especially Lidcombe Station. Station has been really um, good. People are asking me questions. One lady unfortunately asked me when enrollments end and that was after it had ended. So I felt really bad for her. <laughs> Said, call them straight away. <laughs> hmm. no, that's unfortunate, but um, yeah, there's, um, I've seen some of your translated materials, which is, is really important. Um, to, to have that information in your language. Uh, now a question for me, uh, if you're elected to the upper house, how do you think you will negotiate with parties like, uh, I understand that should be one nation. Um, yeah, so I think in approaching people who have come to parliament from a possibly elected based on a different uh, set of values or to represent, um, um, a different group of voters, I think there's always common ground to be found because at the end of the day, we're all, we're all people. And I would hope that everyone who's getting into politics uh, is doing so because they have a vision of the world that they want to see. And it's just, um, it's, it's not plausible that we have no overlap at all in what we want to see. So I think finding that common ground is, um, probably one of the most important things that uh, um, that our elected representatives can do to try and push the country forward um, in the, the direction that um, in directions that most people want it to go to go in. Um, um, 
Yeah, so I'm just trying to think of uh, examples from my professional life, but um, I, I neglected to mention this. I've come from a, a lab science background, so um, I've, um, I don't know, at times I've, I've presented at scientific conferences with people who have a different opinion about how we should solve a problem, but ultimately we're all trying to solve the same problem and, um, um, yeah, I think we can find that common ground. Um, so we've got some comments in the chat with uh, where our preferences, uh, preference suggestions are. Thank you for posting those in the chat. Um, and another question from Kate, how much have you given, uh, how much thought have you given to social determinations of ill health? And continuing that question in particular, closing the gap in Indigenous health. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I can help with that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, All right. Um, I think that addressing things like this, these are very social issues. So they are connected to community. They are connected to context and environment. And um, the reason why I've chosen climate and transparency and integrity to be my priorities is because really, I think the lack of accountability and trust in government has led to decisions where um, have impacted on welfare and climate. Um, and then climate not being addressed has led to health implications like the increase of um, pollution, which is affecting just breathing. Um, it's in fact, uh, affected the environment for property. So we've got floods and fires. So it's harder for people to just have safe housing and and they are, you know, stranded. And then that leads to other uh, health issues because they are not sheltered anymore and they not um, allowed basic hygiene. Um, so I think all of those things are connected and we have to get to the root cause of uh, what needs to be solved to help everyone. And so ultimately, I think we really need to be able to provide the basics for everyone to be able to live safely and healthily. So one way is reduce poverty. I think, you know, we've come so far in the world with our knowledge, with our resources, with technology, there should be no tolerance to poverty, especially in Australia. And I think that's one way that we can help address social impacts and social causes in health. Mm. And um, Fusion does have a policy of, well, it's sometimes called universal basic income, but um, I, I prefer to describe it as a guaranteed livable income of $500 a week for everyone who does not have um, that as an income uh, no hoops to jump through, none of the job search requirements that you have to do now for Centrelink, which just burdens the local small businesses with um, the, the same people looking for work because there are more people looking for work than there are jobs. It's, um, it's inhumane as it is absurd to punish people for not having a job. Uh, so it's, um, it's our strong belief that people should just be afforded an income uh, that covers the, the basics of living. Uh, and when you're unburdened from the stress of wondering where your next meal is going to come from and whether you can pay the rent, that helps you make the best decisions in life because you're, uh, you're not overly stressed. Your system's not full of cortisol all the time, just trying to survive. Um, and coming back to the original question of social determinations of health, um, I think we do have to start from the... Um, from the assumption that no one wants to be unwell. So when people are unwell, it's because the system has not been accommodating to them and it's not suited them. Um, no, one's, no one goes out, no one wakes up with the intention of thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to stay unwell today. Um, and on, on the topic of healthcare as well, um, we, uh, would very much urgently like to see uh, dental and mental health care added to um, under Medicare. There's uh, some, some number of 
visits that you can have for mental health every year, but uh, it's not enough. Uh, dental care is uh, not enough. In, in some states, you can get dental care if you uh, have a low income or uh, um, you know, under 18, but uh, it doesn't cover everyone. And that's, that's one of the best examples of preventative health care that could be added to Medicare. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Kate. Uh, now the next question is from James. Um, what is Fusion's predicted outcome this election? I'm in Reed and we are weighing up between Labor or Fusion. What impact can I have to society for voting Fusion? Uh, Sahar, I guess you might want to take this one and uh, I suppose that yes. includes the question of why it's important to uh, vote for a, a small party if you like them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the eternal question. So um, the reason why I'd say if you resonate with what fusion stands for, so this is the thing, I don't want to be telling people how to vote because voting is the most important voice that you have in our democracy. And I want to support that by having a fair and informed democracy. So I will help you make that decision. And I think if you resonate with fusion, then um, it really sends a clear message if you vote fusion first and then vote for the other parties that you resonate with as well, including Greens, including Labor, because um, what happens is, so uh, we get a lot of questions about preferencing. Um, so I think I'll just try and summarize how it works. So everyone counts the first preference votes. And if no one gets a clear 50% majority, 50% and over majority of the first preference, they then knock out the party that had the least votes in the first round and they go and they redistribute those second preferences and then count the second preferen preferences. We've heard, you know, some people in the past say, I'll vote Labor 1 and vote Science 2. But if you do that, then Science will never see your vote and... Um, Anthony Green, who loves analysing the data. And, and people take this seriously. People look at how you vote. I know there's been a lot of misinformation saying, um, you know, you can waste a vote or it doesn't really matter. You have to choose Liberal or Labor. That's, you know, sneaky propaganda from the majors. So you feel disillusioned and you don't investigate and you just put one Liberal, one Labor. But we don't want to do that. So if you resonate with fusion, vote one fusion and then vote for the other parties that you like. Um, and then it will end up being uh, a liberal or labor government because they have enough people to make the governance team. So uh, I hope that answers your question. There's more I can say to that. Um, and uh, yeah. I think, I think that's everything I can say about that. Does that answer your question? Let me know. Let's have a chat. Mm, and Michael's posted the Chicken Nation voting comment, uh, comic about preferences in the chat there. It's pretty great. Um, and might also uh, you know, explain graphically why it's important to vote for a small party first if, if they resonate with you. Uh, Brendan? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, one of the important parts is um, just like I talked about Anthony Green, right? If you put enough small parties as number one, then the, say, for instance, you want to, you want, you like Labor, right? You want Labor to effectively get in government, but you like, uh, would you like to send your vote to Fusion, okay? So how does that work? You don't want Liberals to win, but you want at least Labor or Greens to win. So you put Fusion number one, then you put your party you want to win as number two. If we don't win, the number two one, assuming that um, it, it's the highest level, they'll, they'll end up getting the vote, right? They'll end up uh, yeah, potentially getting the point. But the most important thing is that you've sent a message um, that there's been a swing against the major parties. And then you'll see a swing towards uh, the, the fusion party or a swing towards an independent or whatever you vote, right? Mm. That swing is what all these politicians look at, especially in marginal seats. Because you can guarantee that next election, those parties um, are going to see that swing and they're going to have used that as an excuse to fix up their policy. Because 
Forget about Labor and Liberal, it don't matter. Every single politician that's sitting in one of their seats is only looking after one thing, their own skin, right? So if, if, I, if I, um, at the end of the day, that politician is going to be moved by that swing because they don't want to get kicked out of parliament, they don't want to lose their seat. So that will encourage them to be better, right? And, and even if we don't win, the message is do better. But also the other important part is that uh, all small parties and independents don't have very much money. So one of the things we rely on is what's called the primary vote. And if we get more than the 4% primary vote, we get our election funding back, which allows us to fund the next campaign. Mm. Um, so that's extremely important. Um, you're sending two ones. One, you're sending a message to the party, but also you're taking away that election funding off the party you don't like. And that's crucial for them because if they start losing electoral funding, they will start taking notice. Mm. Yeah, and if I can just just before I um, bring James in, just talking about electoral funding um, and the, the costs to run an election, it costs $2,000 just to put your name on the ballot to try and represent your community. And if you win uh, less than 4% of the number one vote, then you lose that. But if you get more than 4% of the number one vote, then you get your $2,000 back as well as, um, um, oh, there's a, an algorithm of reimbursements and uh, amounts per vote. So uh, that's another, another very good reason to vote for a non-major party if they resonate with you. James? Yeah, I mean, I was mostly going to say very similar things to what Lauren said, but um, I would also add that, you know, the only way small parties become big parties is, is if you give them a pat on the back, right? So we've come forward and we've said, hey, we've joined together with Confusion, we're trying to build momentum and enthusiasm and, you know, let's say these are important policies. If, you know, we as the party and see, all oh, right, hey, we got, we got, 4% of the vote in, in these electorates or Andrea got the X percent in the Senate. We're like, oh, that's, this is resonating with people. We'll be encouraged to keep trying and get new members and be enthusiastic for the next election. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of our gamble to say, hey, electorate, everyone, is this thing a good idea? And every vote is giving us the feedback that yes, this is a good idea. You should keep trying to do this. If we, if I go and I get five votes, then I'm going to think, well, that was a kind of a waste of time. Um, <laughs> if I get a few thousand votes, then I'll be thinking, oh right, yeah, actually, what I did and what I was trying to do is making a difference. Thanks, James. I'll move on to the. Uh, I think this is the last question we got in the chat right now, uh, and it's from Blake, and it's possibly one that I'll bring Jeff in for. Um, I understand from the speakers that a party can't have policies in all areas, but do you have an arts policy? I know Ireland is trialling a UBI for 20,000 artists. Thanks, been a great inspiring discussion. Thank you for signing in, Blake. Um, so um, I don't know if there's um, any thoughts that you have immediately there about um, uh, minimum uh, incomes for artists there, Jeff? Well, yeah, of course. Um, look, I think UBI uh, is a good idea for the arts community. I also think we need to look at um, minimal, pro uh, at the moment, we're trying to advocate for, say, a, a 250 per player minimum for for venues to, to in enforce that. That's with the, the unions are advocating for um, so but we were our, that industry was hit very very hard by the pandemic I mean I, I work in a different area so I was kind of sheltered from it but um, my friends that are that are part of that that economy have, have been devastated the people that um, the people that run your your PA systems, your light shows, your you know your staging people, all of those all of those industries that, that cost a lot of money of, of, and and require a lot of staff have, have um, been very hard. So yeah, the, a basic income of five hundred bucks a week, I think, would be would be a superb thing to to look towards to to fight for. Um, if yeah. it's universal, then it's obviously going to affect people in the art sector and. 
Uh, it's, it's not only musicians, it's you, it's you. My God, the amount of theatres I've sat in with 30 people and, and most of them were relatives. Um, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, no, the, we need we need to be uh, looking at that as a serious thing. We need to treat arts as a profession. I mean, you know, quite often here, it's even even in the situation I was in, I'd, I'd have people. If like when I was when I was working in the states, it's a profession. Um, in Australia, you say, "What do you do?" And I say, "Oh, I'm a composer." And they go, "Oh, that's lovely, but what do you do for a living?" Um, it must be a nice hobby, you know. <laughs> and you go, no, it's actually a profession. It's a it's a living it's a living profession. Mm. Um, yeah, no, the, the gig economy is uh, definitely it's a, in Australia. It needs to be recognised. Most of and we we lose most of our talent. Most of the people, like you know, I made more money in the USA than I made here. You know, I have a house because because of what I did in the USA, not so much from what I did in Australia. I'd be still working in, um, you know, jazz clubs for, you know, 50 bucks a night. Mm, that's an interesting parallel between the arts and the sciences that we we don't respect those professions. And we see a lot of um, artists and scientists move overseas to, to greener pastures. Well, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, you know, I worked with a, a guy who was a software engineer who... Um, is now a nuclear physicist in London. Mm. Well, the, COVID the COVID pandemic, as you as you mentioned, of course, the, the pandemic's uh, not over, but um, during lockdowns, any anyone who um, was not only performing, but as you say, involved in all the support of any face-to-face -face arts events, um, a lot of them were not eligible for JobKeeper and had to take the much uh, lower rate of job seeker because um, of the, the rules around JobKeeper and it didn't apply to a lot of casually employed people. So I think that's a, um, a disparity that uh, needs to be called out. But as for uh, an arts policy, Blake, um, to answer the, the nub of the question, um, we haven't got um, an arts policy as such. I understand the best thing you can do for the arts is to show up to the arts um, and uh, hopefully the the UBI or the minimum guaranteed income is very relevant to artists. Uh, now John you had your hand up. Yeah well I suppose the guaranteed minimum income I know there was mention of that for artists but I do think that the guaranteed minimum income should be for everybody and not just artists, but it would be a, an important part of that picture. And I, I suppose, yes, you know, I'm more of an amateur. I am in, involved in spoken word and poetry and I have actually organized a live music night. So I have sort of been hooked up into live music in, uh, in Sydney to some degree. But I guess I'm going back to the Pirate Party, which is not so much fusion, but we have had a policy involving tax incentives for venues that do actually do live music. So on the one hand, OK, minimum payment for performers, good idea. But the other side of things is to also make that a bit easier by uh, giving the venues uh, tax breaks to assist them in doing that. So that's not quite a comprehensive arts policy, but it is one of the things that, that we did think of. Thanks, John. Uh, Brendan, also? Yeah, I was going to say, um, uh, one of the things that, as an engineer, is that I was inspired, uh, I suppose, when I first went to university, we thought, uh, when we heard about the arts students, it was all about, oh, you know, like, you know, it was always engineers versus arts, right? It wasn't until later on that uh, I had, like, an epiphany, and it's like, you know, I'm an engineer, and I like all this stuff that uh, I like science fiction, I like movies, I like all this, and you go, guess where all that's created from? The music scores, the, the cinematography, the computer graphics, it's all arts, mm. right? And uh, It's so integrated into our lives we don't notice. Absolutely, right? And it was just like, you know, arts is what inspired me to become an engineer, right? And uh, until you make that, 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 that uh, I suppose, that the connection, just think about every, every almost lot of the, almost everything that's been invented lately. It's usually had some prediction um, in, in some book or some poem or something, uh, maybe 20, 30, maybe even up to 100 years ago. 
And engineer went, that's pretty cool. I'm going to make that. And that's how you got your smartphone and your tablets and all of that stuff, right? So it, it's absolutely crucial that we keep that arts alive and we should be funding a lot more of it uh, because arts and engineering go hand in hand um, and, and science as well, right? It, right? It, we really need to support that. And uh, I see other countries overseas like, uh, like Korea, they have massive amounts of uh, funding into the entertainment sector, which they export around the world. And Australia used to do the much the same thing, but we pretty much don't do that anymore. We've pretty much shut down all local uh, movie and production lists, some of those big blockbusters. But local homegrown TV, we don't do it anymore. And that's sad, and it's, it's a loss for our Australian culture. It's a loss for our identity. Um, and also it's a loss for you know, a lot of people who are employed by those sectors. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Um, Simon uh, comments in the chat here, art is what kept people sane during the lockdowns. Um, I'd have to agree with that. Now, I, um, I'm an amateur musician, so uh, you know, I was lucky not to have lost income through the, the devastation of the arts industry, but it's, it's what I do for a hobby. I've been turning up to orchestra rehearsals every week since I, was, uh, since I started high school. And um, the, the ways that we found to still come together and rehearse online uh, were extremely creative and, um, as you say, kept us sane. Uh, James, had some comment on this one? Yeah, I mean, uh, mostly a sidetrack. I, I just think this is actually part of a more general issue with um, positions that people do for, for love or for benefit to society um, often end up getting underpaid or not paid at all. So, you know, you see this in arts, but you also see it in, in the sciences, in, in research, people sort of, you know, choosing to try and make the world better rather than getting paid High, a higher pay elsewhere in the industry and you also see it in in things like education and um healthcare and um in, in particular things like early childhood care um where these professions that are really valuable to society end up not being monetarily rewarded now i don't think there's an easy answer to any of this. I mean, personally, I'm still thinking about it, but I, I think it's interesting to think about all of these together. And one of the fusion policies, which I'm probably going to misrepresent, is to try and measure society in ways that are, you know, not just GDP. Um, and I think this is where it comes in to sort of really the first step to 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 valuing all these things better is to actually ironically to just measure them better in the first place to say actually yeah this is something we value in society we should track this thing we shouldn't just be saying oh we're, our economy is up three percent we, sh we should be saying something about the, the nation's culture as, as, or you know, as hard as that is thank you james well we have come to uh nine o'clock and we've come to the end of the questions in the chat so I will in a moment uh, end the recording, um, but uh, I think we'll be sitting online uh, with the candidates for a little longer in case anyone had uh, questions that they want to ask casually. So thank you all for joining this event. We've had some great questions from you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Brendan, and for sharing with us your belief in our, ourselves that we can advance our technology and society. Uh, Jeff, um, with your focus on equal opportunity and the way that corruption destroys that opportunity. Uh, John, with your passions for separation of church and state and fair regulation of IP. Uh, James, um, you're excited about um, having a space to discuss good policy, and I think we all share that. And um, Saha, thank you for sharing your drive to represent the community and to push for political accountability. So thank you again, everyone. Um, we are your Fusion candidates for New South Wales. You can find us at fusionparty.org.au and on all our social media channels. Um, and uh, please, in the lead up to the election, uh, continue to ask us anything. Thank you, everyone.